Hey everybody, Nathan Long, president of Quest Trust Company. I am excited to bring you how to borrow and lend more from private money using self-directed IRAs. This has got to be one of my favorite topics. And the reason why it's my favorite topic is I happen to know a lot about it. Um, it's kind of a, what led me into all types of things, but, but my, myself and my family really enjoy lending as a practice of investing and it's worked really well for us. Uh, of course, Quincy's an attorney and um, Forrest, who's my cousin uh, and also an attorney and my wife's an attorney. So that always helps to have attorneys on. But honestly, uh, most of the time when I'm borrowing the lenders paying the attorney's fees and those things, and that's not a big deal in there uh, as I'll talk, uh, talk about. But it's just been really good to our family, um, learning how to lend um, um, and what to do right. So I like to call this maybe, uh, you know, putting on two hats because I'm going to talk about how to be a good borrower, but I'll start with how to be a good lender, right? What you want to do to protect yourself as a lender. Borrowers, pay attention because this is what will lead you to understand how to be a good borrower is because you're really building a relationship with your lender. And of course, as always, Quest doesn't provide tax, legal, or investment advice. Um, we don't sell any products. We don't endorse any products. If you see somebody at one of our events or something and they're networking and they have an investment, make sure you're taking the time to do your own due diligence. Look into that person themselves. At Quest, uh, we don't do due diligence on investments. It's very, very important to understand. Um, that you know what each investment entails and the risks and how to deal with it. And we'll talk a lot about that during this speech. We'll talk about what to do, um, you know, if, if something goes wrong and how, how you think about those risks and, and those type of things. So we'll, we'll analyze some of that as we go through. A little bit of basic information. I always like to give this uh, basics class or, or a little bit of basic information just so we have a reminder. If you're watching these classes, you really should have started with uh, uh, the class uh, about getting started with self-directed IRAs. So that's, that's where everything, you know, revolves and leads into every other class. So this is the same information. So I'm going to kind of go through it quick because uh, a lot of you may have heard it before, but a little reminder that a self-directed IRA really isn't a type of IRA. There's um, uh, all different types of IRAs and self-directed just kind of as describes what we do. The reality of it is we just hold private assets while other companies hold publicly traded assets. And most of my clients have an account in both places and we just transfer back and forth. So you buy your stocks, bonds, and mutual funds over with Charles Schwab, Fidelity, whoever. And, you know, at Quest, we have the, the real estate and loans. We're talking about one of the things today, private placements, all right? So that's really the only difference. It's important to understand how long it takes to transfer the money back and forth, but it's usually not too difficult to call it a process. There's a lot of benefits to having a self-directed account, which includes allowing diversification into real estate assets and other types of things. Of course, Anytime you're talking about wealth building, you should be looking at tax savings and the benefits that you have associated with that. But there's also a lot of social investments, especially to lending. You know, if I'm lending to, to uh, an investor, it might be a little property they can't normally get that type of loan on. It allows them to, to buy a house that's maybe a blight in our community and fixing it up and creating jobs, all while paying me above average interest secured by real estate. And I think that's a really important part or borrowers. Sometimes when you're talking about using someone's money, you might point out that what they're doing may not be very aligned with their social intent, right? In other words, if I'm buying mutual funds and I, I cast a big large net uh, so that I can, you know, pass out the, my um, risk between a bunch of different companies, I'm also casting a big net may catch companies that aren't aligned with my ethical or my political intentions. It, you know, so I think there is a lot of social or conscious investments that go on in the self-directed world, especially in lending. But it also allows you to invest in things that you know and understand, you know. Um, yes, probably buying real estate and doing flips and some of these other strategies are strategies that 
go faster. And then Arlen goes, well, Nathan, why do you spend so much time lending? I say, because it really works for me. I have a full-time job. I enjoy my job at Quest. I don't need another job investing, right? We have to be mindful of our investments. We need to know what to do. But that's why I always advocate using professionals and using this. And it works well for me. It really has. And we'll talk more about that, right? So if a self-directed IRA isn't a type of account, what type of accounts can be self-directed? Well, we've got a lot of different types. We have kind of break them up in different categories, right? We've got the personal plans. Those are your traditional and Roth IRA. Roth IRAs are really fun because everything grows tax-free in those, right? We talk a lot about converting traditional IRA funds to Roth IRA funds in our class about uh, Roth conversions. Watch that one. Uh, it's really good. But something that's interesting to understand is that most people's money is in traditional IRAs because it came from their employer plans like their 401k or 403b or maybe a thrift savings plan or something like that. Those are all tax deferred plans and it does cost them to move that money. In other words, we have to pay tax on it when we move that money into a Roth IRA. So consequently, a lot of times when you're borrowing people's money, you're not borrowing from the Roth IRA, you might be borrowing from the traditional IRA. We also offer employer plans like SEP IRAs. A lot of people like to use those. They work very well for self-employed. Simple IRAs for like small businesses. And we also have this product called a solo or individual 401k. Again, all very powerful products. But also, you can use health savings accounts and even covered L education accounts for your minor children to do these same investment strategies that we talk about, like buying real estate, lending, private placements, we can combine these to do these as well. And that's really fascinating. If you haven't watched uh, the online account, specialty accounts uh, for special expenses, it's an amazing class. It's really worth taking a little bit of time and watching, you know, open your eyes as to doing it. And this, this next point I want to make is really important, whether you're a borrower or a lender. It really, really is. Uh, it's important because you can combine these accounts. I know that you might be disqualified persons. For example, my IRA and my wife's IRA is a disqualified person to each other. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. They can't buy, sell, and trade together, but that doesn't keep us from partnering together. I can take, when I, most of the time when I do loans, I have an investor come to me and say, hey, I got this house I want to buy and fix up and I need a hundred grand. And you know, if I looked at my IRA account, I'd look at it, I might have 42. Do I just pass on it? No, I, I, I call my son, say, hey son, you got any funds in your IRA? And he looks at his and I look at my wife's and my mom's and my brothers and my cousin Forrest and we, we will all partner up including these small accounts like our HSAs and Coverdells for nieces and nephews and other types of things like that. So all of those things, we partner them together and create one loan. And it's pretty cool because when the payments come in at Quest, as long as we're splitting those up according to our percentages of ownership, right? Well, of course, their systems are designed so it, it will split those up automatically for us uh, as we put them all in. And it works pretty well. Uh, you also only pay one transaction fee, even if you have a bunch of accounts on it, you're really only buying one asset. So it's only getting charged that one fee. I mean, the other, they, they'll have their annual fees on the different accounts, but, you, but again, it, it, it's not like you have to pay a transaction fee to have four or five different accounts on there. Well, what does that do for either the lender or the borrower? Well, for, for the lender's sake, it's great. Um, a lot of people may run into my son sometimes. He is a IRA specialist currently at Quest Trust Company. Um, pretty good at his job. But I wish you could fast forward back in time when he was like 18 years old, you know, long hair. I was trying to talk about investments because I'm all excited about them, you know. And I probably sounded like the peanuts guy, like, anyway, he didn't want to hear about it. So how I got through to him is I said, son, I'm going to give you $5,000. He's like, cool. I said, but I'm going to put it in this Roth IRA and you can't have access to it until it's 59 and a half, which actually wasn't true because you can move contributions to a Roth IRA tax free and penalty free at any age at any time. But I didn't want to tell him that at that time. I just told him that he couldn't have it for a while and, I'll put it, and I'm going to put myself as a power of attorney on my account, right? 
um, and control the investments. And then I would partner his investments with my larger investments. I'd take money that was from my traditional IRAs or, you know, larger Roth IRAs I have, and I'd partner them and I would invest. And then he would see how that would work. And he'd get statements back and kind of like, and over time he learned, you know, hey, this is pretty cool. My little bit of money is turning into a lot more money by using these things. And each time I talk about them and things, and that way I was able to communicate with him. To this day, you know, he's intricately involved in our investments together. Uh, and our parents, and it's helpful because you're piggybacking these small accounts with the larger accounts, right? But you're also opening up these channels of communication, talking about investments between your parents and your children and everybody's things. And the best education you can give your children is teaching them about investments. And I'd argue that they're probably not getting that anywhere else if you're not teaching them. So it's a great tool for you. Borrowers, think about it. You're gonna walk up to someone and ask them if you can borrow $100,000 or whatever, um, and they could lend it to you, but if they're lending it to you from their IRAs, and then we learn that most people's households have all different types of IRAs. You had that 401k, and you have an HSA, and you have a Coverdell, and you had that Roth IRA from back then. We can take from these different accounts and partner them together to create one loan, all right? And now we're also talking to different members of the family and, and doing this. And I should be clear, I don't think it's wise to partner non-related type people together in a loan without some type of actual legal document like a joint venture or something like this. In these cases, you know, if something went wrong, the people involved are myself traditional IRA and my Roth IRA. In other words, we're not going to argue with each other. My, my um, spouse might be involved or, or uh, but people that are very closely related. D don't try to partner if you're not without some type of good legal document in there. And most of the time that becomes expensive enough for this type of investment. It just doesn't make sense to it. So you can usually find what you need, you know, in small groups like that uh, uh, to make things work. And I don't think it's a good idea to bring people together that you don't know to be able to do an investment like that without some things, okay? And what can you invest in? Uh, uh, Quest, we kind of break it up because some people like to buy directly into real estate. You know, they use their IRA to directly purchase real estate. We're pretty good at that, actually. Um, and then some people like to use LLCs or limited partnerships, joint ventures. So we have a private entities department, but also of course we have a special notes department. So if you're going to do lending or borrow someone's IRA, you're going to be working with our notes department, which are very efficient with working with the title companies and all the parties involved and in understanding what needs to happen to get a note process quickly. And I think that's pretty cool. I think that's uh, interesting rather than you're dealing with, all the different parties you're dealing with specific people that deal help you with your investment and that are knowledgeable about your investment all right i got to talk a little bit about restrictions um and again the 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 beginning the start of the class goes into it in depth but it's really important to understand these restrictions when we're talking about lending right because iras and especially when i'm talking about these partner IRAs, right are disqualified to other, each other, right? There are restrictions on IRA. There are people restrictions, transaction restrictions, and investment restrictions. And we never want to do one of these because it becomes a prohibited transaction, all right? The big one we really worry about is disqualified persons. And the reason why, this is the one that's easy to break and hard to understand, right? But there are people who are disqualified from doing business with the IRA. They can't buy, sell, trade, or extend services to or from. Who are these people? It's you. You are disqualified from your IRA. Why? Because it's supposed to be that your benefits in the future, right? So if we lend money out of our IRA, the payments come back to the IRA, the IRA gets bigger, you can continue to lend. And we got that. You cannot borrow, lend your IRA to yourself. In addition to you, there are people who are equally disqualified to your IRA. That includes you, your spouse, your lineal ascendants and descendants, their spouses, and companies those people own, control, manage, or highly compensated by. 
all of those people cannot do what? Well, they can't buy, sell, trade, loan, extend a service, or receive a benefit directly or indirectly. Everyone follow that? One reason why I like lending, if I'm lending to a person, as long as they're not on my disqualified person list, I, it's very hard for anyone to argue that I'm extending a service or doing anything else uh, when I'm done doing with it. Also, as a lender, I tend to have a, a veil of protection, right? It's not the same as being a joint venture on there. I have a, I'm, I, I have a lot more legal responsibility there. So there's some protection to the IRA and the IRA already has asset protection that's built into it as an IRA itself. So um, lending does work this way. It, it's helpful in these things. So if you're a lender, we're going to put on our lender's hat for a while now, and then we'll switch to our borrower's hat. But if you're a lender, what is it that you're, uh, that you're worried about, right? Um, let's, so let's talk about things that I want you to do from a lender's perspective. These are basically my rules. And I like to tell some people sometimes that I came across these rules very painfully sometimes. I love the way Quincy puts it. It's like this. Quincy, how did you get so smart? He said, oh, I did a lot of dumb things. Let that sink in. So learn by my, our lessons instead of life's experiences much better. Lesson one, never loan on something you wouldn't be happy to own if the borrower defaults. So if the borrower defaults on a loan, right, if you're secure by the best thing in the world, but it's something that you don't want to own, you may not want to consider it. There was a time in our lives where we lent to a very nice couple that was rehabbing a small house on a big property. But what they had done is they were putting, they were buying new prefabricated homes that were completely shelled out and placing them on there and they were running a luxury dog kennel there very successfully. Paying us above average interest rate, we were secure, first lien position secured by the property. Um, they were foreign born, uh, and you know, it was more difficult for them to get traditional financing and some things. It worked out very well for us for many, many years. Then they were deported. Um, and we ended up having to foreclose on that property. And so I think still to this day, Quincy still owns some interest in a dog kennel, by the way. You know, so it's very interesting and a long story of how he had to maneuver to uh, work at that. But sometimes it's always important to understand, lend on things that you wouldn't mind own. Like I like to lend on properties that are in certain areas, you know, close to my home. I live in Houston. Uh, you know, that are not super expensive, but not way, way, way dirt cheap because that kind of in between and just know what to do with it in the event a default occurred and I had to have that property, right? <clears throat> Generally, when I'm lending on a private loan and a borrower's come to me and they have a deal, right, there's typically repairs that are involved. And if provided that there's enough equity in the deal, in other words, the after repair value is this high, and, you know, and we bought it for this and there's some repairs in there, then um, generally what I would not do is advance any funds for those repairs. Let me explain. So at the closing, I would have, I, I, there would be enough to fund the transaction, certainly for the person to take possession of the property, but then they would have to do a set of repairs. I would then inspect that set of repairs to see if it's done properly and then cut a check. And then they do another set of repairs, see if it's done properly and cut a check. In other words, they had to have at least enough of a relationship with their contractor or enough money to go through a set of repairs as I cut the check. That way I was ensuring that each step along the way that uh, 
you know, the repairs were getting done and the, the, it was being advanced. And that's the proper way to do it. Notice I say generally. There are some times that I've made exceptions to these rules that worked out fine for me. I'll give some examples. There was an investor I'd done a lot of investing with and he was purchasing a property. The property was pretty inexpensive, but it needed a whole bunch of repairs. The big portion of the job was a repair. But because we bought the lot so inexpensively, I felt comfortable advancing the first set of repairs, like $20,000, and then we inspected to see those were done, and then we had to do another advance. Some things about this relationship that starts to define your relationship between your borrower and lender when you start to deal with repairs. It becomes very important to the borrower that they be able to have access to the check very clearly like quickly if, if they've done some repairs so they can move on to the next one. So you have to be able to get out there and inspect, look at it, and fund very quickly if they're ready for the next check. That's, that's an important thing to understand because time on the market costs them money, you know, and you don't want, want to make it too laborious for them. Here's the other thing. Borrower and lender, both be aware of this. Take time when we're writing the loan to make sure that you've written out all the repairs that you expect to make and the repair schedule. Lenders, you may have to be flexible here. Often, they don't know, they're trying to do it in this exact order that they've listed, but the contractors don't like to always schedule at the same time that, that's on there. So sometimes they have to pay for this done first and some other things. And the whole point is, is that they're advancing on this list before you're cutting the next check. And you guys should be able to have a conversation about that if it needs to change somewhat be flexible. Uh, just some thoughts on that. What else? This one is very important. Very, very, very important is don't loan to somebody that you'd feel uh, comfortable foreclosing on. You know, I have people go, well, Nathan, you do business with people in your family all the time. Yes, but we're all on the same side of the fence, right? We're all gathering up our money and then we're lending it or putting it into this deal or buying something, right? We're all doing it together with our IRAs as a family. That is different than someone loan, right? If you went back to my disqualified persons list, I get this all the time. I get people, hey, you know, um, how about I just lend to my girlfriend or my significant other that I live with, but I'm not married to. They're not on that disqualified persons list. That's a bad idea for a lot of reasons that I'm not even going to go into here, but it could be also still considered prohibitive because if you're sharing a checking account or something like that, you do it from your IRAs, they'll deem that you are still receiving a, a benefit directly and it could be prohibited as, as well. Just don't do it because you always got to think from the perspective of what happens if something happens and I have to foreclose or take that asset. Do you really want to take it? Here's the next thing. With an IRA, you can't just go, oh, I'm sorry, that didn't work out. I'll just wash my hands of it. No, if the asset actually goes bad, in other words, your, your borrower stops paying you, right? You have to make show that you've made, either made an attempt to foreclose or that that asset no longer has value. You can't just let that other person do it. You're going to be forced to either take legal action or possibly pay a lot of taxes and penalties. Either choice is not good, right? If you have real love or concern for the person. So generally, they don't loan to people that you'd feel uncomfortable foreclosing on. Know your state's foreclosure laws. I live in Texas, and it's very easy to foreclose, right? You could, as little as 20 days notice uh, after being late, um, post it on the foreclosure board. Uh, uh, 21 days later, you can foreclose, depending on when the first Tuesday of the month is. We do it every Tuesday of the month. Very quick, very easy. Um, if I had to foreclose, I would go back to the attorney that drafted the note and the deed of trust. That's why it's, a lot of times, I'll be honest, I don't like to use title company attorneys. I like to use private attorneys. People say, oh, you say that because your wife is a real estate attorney. She's not taking any new clients. So that's not why at all all and she's doing other types of work now but for a lot of years she was a real estate attorney and so you know the borrower typically is paying that out of the proceeds that come from the loan and but 
the lender, uh, the attorneys representing the lender's interest or drafting those documents for the lender's interest, right? The lender has fulfilled their obligation as soon as they give them the money. That's their, their part of the job. So all that documentation is for the borrower to make sure that the lender's work. So if something ever happened to my lender, they passed away, they got sick, they stopped making payments, I want to know where to go or to who to help me. And so I'm going to go back to that attorney that drafted them. That's why I like to have a relationship with my attorney. And there's plenty of uh, good real estate attorneys that, that you can do it. And, and it's all about the same price. So um, something to think about. Borrowers, introduce your, your people to a good attorney. Say, yes, the attorney fees are getting paid out of the proceeds of the loan. But, you know, so I'm basically paying for them. But this is your attorney. If anything goes wrong, man, that really helps them to make them feel good. If you ever do have a default on the loan, do not delay. Take action immediately. You can always stop, right? But I guarantee you that if you immediately send out a letter, notice that you're late, notice a default right away, your borrower will snap too. Never wait, never delay. You must act like a professional if you're going to be a lender. And that means following it up with knowing how to write a letter about being late, apply late fees, right? Uh, know your state's applicable late fee laws. In Texas, it's very small, like 5%. Uh, but no matter what, you always want to do that. It establishes your relationship to your borrower as a professional one, and that's what it should always remain, all right? Borrowers don't, you know, same thing. You should talk about it. I always talk about the fact that one of the things that borrowers and lenders should discuss is how and when the payment's going to be made. And I always encourage them to do it like ACH or electronically, which is very easy to do uh, with IRAs. You know, there's just, we have systems in their portals that you just log in and pay, boom, right? <clears throat> so easy to do that way, trackable, and everyone can see it as it comes in. And then you should follow up, especially like on your first payment. Hey, I just made that first payment. I did it this way. You know, let me know to make sure that you got it. I want to make sure the things, man, that, that speaks volumes to the lender. If you're making the first deal with them and the borrower is following up to make sure that you're saying, Hey, are you okay? You know, so uh, just some things to think about. Always, I suggest, design the loans so that there is monthly interest. And there's several reasons to do this, guys. And I know it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Flippers, I get it. They're just like, oh, Nathan, don't say that. I like to, I like to just pay it all off at the end. Well, why? Well, that's when they get paid. They're not getting any payments. They're having to construction guys go out. And if they're having to make uh, monthly interest payments on the loan that you've given them, that's just another expense that they have to deal with, uh, just like countertops and everything else. So a lot of them like to pay it at the end. Yeah, it's in your IRA. What difference does it make? Well, there's several reasons that it makes difference. One of the big things is um, I've had instances where exactly what we're talking about is that the um, borrower passed away unexpectedly. Well, you know, the heirs didn't know what to do with any of this stuff. But if there was not monthly payments, there's no default trigger. So then there was no, nothing to allow us to foreclose. So we can foreclose very quickly in the state of Texas. There, was no, there would be no trigger. So you always want to have monthly payments on there. Okay. Borrowers. This helps you to establish yourself professionally with your lenders. Also, think about this. A lot of my lenders are reaching retirement age or at retirement age. And this is a bucket of money that they're using to create income to live on, you know, so they don't have to spend it down. So they're giving you $100,000 and they're expecting um, a $900 check every month or whatever. I, you know, that is income to them that they're living on. Understand that opens you up to a lot more lenders if you're making those monthly payments to them. And it, just like I kind of alluded to, take a look at your overall cost of your project 
include the cost of the money that it takes to make those payments and make sure that you're over allowing for, for your repairs enough so that you're getting enough from the escrow, right? If you can't get enough into your calculation that way, it may not be the right deal. I'm just gonna point that out. So, so just add it into your cost as part of the things, one of the things that you need to know. Um, if, if you're unsure about a, a loan, want to hire a professional to help you evaluate the deal. And that typically is talking about the comps, right? If you don't know an area, you know, you've got a borrower who's presented you with a, a loan, seems respectful, the, the deal seems respectful, but you just don't know much about the area. It may be worth your money to call a realtor in that area to say, hey, what do you think of the comps on a house that was repaired in the, this area? Or sometimes you can just talk to another real estate professional. Often I can find someone at a real estate club or something uh, that I've talked to before or, or, or a meeting that may be more familiar with the area to help me look at those comps as well. But, it, but sometimes just having that second set of eyes is really helpful. Always insist, if you're the lender, to get title insurance for your loan. See, they always get title insurance whenever we close at a title company, always close at a title company and not only get title insurance, but you need to have a writer on there that it's a, it's a lender's writer. So, so that if it defaults, the title insurance carries over to you. It's very inexpensive. Um, all lenders require it like regular bank lenders. So title companies are very used to that. Just make sure you ask for and get title insurance that covers you as a lender on the loan, right? And also, you know, verify hazard, uh, and if necessary, flood insurance is on it. Again, if you're closing a title company, they should be checking that. But make sure that your attorney that's drafting up the documents is putting that in their closing instructions, the instructions they give the title company, the things that you want, and evidence that the property taxes are paid, right? And sometimes what happens is they may be paid at the time of closing, but it, you know, they still have it when it comes around. So what I always suggest you do is call your borrower and ask them to prove that they've paid the taxes for this year, right? And then verify it. And then I get on the county records and check it and make sure, right? And um, also I do the same thing thing, of course, with flood insurance. But with also flood insurance, it's important to understand that you should be listed on there as uh, the lender. You want to be listed on the insurance policy as the lender in case there's a major catastrophe you're involved. Uh, there's just not a check that's written and, and no repairs are then done on the property. All right. Also, you're often lending to a LLC, which is very wise. Um, I like or prefer lending to LLCs versus people. Um, most real estate investors use an LLC for asset protection reasons, and that, that makes sense. But I include, in, have the attorney include in there, a personal guarantee that is also wraps around that LLC. That borrower should be able to give me his personal guarantee as well as the guarantee from the LLC's assets. That, that they're holding. Um, and that's usually not a problem to get, right? Consider, there's first liens and second liens. Do you want to be in second position? I usually won't, right? And Texas and in every state, the laws are different. So I have to keep referring back to Texas. So uh, check your state laws. But in Texas, the second lien can be wiped out pretty easily um, by the first, and if you don't have enough reason. So the, the only time I put myself in second, even if there's a whole bunch of equity in there, is a couple of things. One, it's an account that's large enough that if I had to cure the first, in other words, pay off the first so, so that I owned it, I could do that. Large and liquid enough, I should say, which is rare. Two, that I know the person that's in first, right? And if this is just something that we had to do to try to fix up the rest of the deal, maybe inject some more money into it or something like that. I know that person um, and I know that they would work, deal with me if I was in that second position. At least I would get notice of it, you know, 
and we can figure something out. That's that's the only times that I do it because most of the time I don't want to be in a second position in a state like Texas where it's very difficult. But make your own decision, but talk about it, right? Do you want to be in first lane? Do you want to be in second position? And are you comfortable with the risk? The big thing about being in second position is understanding what to do if it goes wrong. If you can handle it, then you're okay. That's back to the same litmus test I give to most due diligence that you do, right? Do you want to allow there to be a second or for your property be, to be wrapped? In other words, you're going to lend and then they're going to turn around and lend to somebody else, you know? Um, and this is personal. So I'll, I'll tell you, I don't like that. I don't like for my loan to be wrapped, and this is why, if something goes wrong in there, and there's several places for it to go wrong, right? The, the, the borrower is, is borrowing my money and then lending it to someone else and servicing that and making it through. That person better be a licensed loan servicer with all the things that, they, they, that go along with that, right? So, Typically, that doesn't work very well for me because if, if it falls apart there, they stop making the loans and payments and everyone stops making payments in there somehow. I'm dealing with foreclosing on a person that's living in that house versus foreclosing on an investor. There's a major difference between those two actions, both legally, right, and just how you feel about it. So uh, I don't like to do that. That being said, I have found that sometimes buying the note from uh, uh, someone else has made sense for me. For example, there are hard minute money lenders out there that will loan money to uh, at a pretty hard rate, right? And they're servicing the loan, they're doing all the work, they're checking all the repairs, and, and they will sell that note and deed of trust to you individually and while they continue to service it and personally guarantee it often. So if the payments aren't made, they have to foreclose, they'll buy them back. I've been doing more of this myself lately. And, and, and this makes sense for a lot of people that, that may not want to or are experienced or want to do um the labor. In my case, it's a, a want to do. I've, I've been very busy lately. And so it's very hard for me to sometimes go out and check to see if repairs are done or do this, you know, or, or drive here, or go, go over there. Um, it's easier for me to receive a lower interest rate, obviously, right? Um, I'm going to get less, less interest, but as a result, I have a professional, you know, and I would never do this once again if it wasn't a professional using a professional service and I'd make sure I understood the paperwork and had it reviewed and many other things like that. But just something to talk about. Uh, again, I think I've already mentioned this before. Never partner with people you don't know. Just your family. You know, if you partner with people you don't know, you need a legal document drafted by an attorney that is specific to this set of events. If you don't have that, don't do it. And, and like I said, with the, most of the time with these type of loans, I'm seeing shorter term loans. Sometimes I have longer term for rental because my interest rates are higher, you know, but they're using those for bridge loans or loans to do flip and repairs, uh, you know, or they might have them for rental property for a little bit and build up a couple of rental properties and take them out with a larger bank loan. All those types of strategies I've seen from my uh, borrower. But again, just don't partner with people you don't know. So here's a little story. This is, we're still on lender's hat. I think this is a couple of little case studies I, I like to always throw in so you can kind of see if how it works. This is a true case story, right? Jack had $100,000 IRA. He loaned it to an investor. He was going to buy a house to fix it up. The property had an after repair value of about 140. Um, I don't think this is the actual property. It's just some picture someone threw up there. So it had about a 70% loan to value. It seemed pretty good. The interest rate that was negotiated was 9%. It's funny. Some people go, oh, that's so high. Other people go, oh, that's so low. I, I think 9% was pre pretty decent in, in this. He also retained a 1% origination fee. The loan was only a one-year uh, loan. So they'd either have to negotiate 
uh, after another year. And I often do this. This is how I do it. I would make my loans for one year. And at the end of that year, we decide whether we're going to redo it. Uh, sometimes, they, like I said, they are renters and they're long-term loans. That's okay. I still just take the time to renew each year, right? It had a minimum loan service of three months. They had to at least make three monthly payments if they fixed it up faster than that. They had to do that. But also the borrower paid the cost for drafting the note and deed of trust. And typically there's a IRA fees if you're borrowing from an IRA. This is very common. And, and again, typically that comes out of the proceeds from the note. That's not typically coming out of the borrower's pocket. It's just being handled as one of the expenses at closing. So just something to think about. Um, so how does it happen? There's a buy direction letter. That's just an internal form of quest, really simple. We help you fill it out. It just tells us what you're doing. So you're signing off to make sure it matches which, what's happening on your note. We're gonna check the note to make sure it's, where it's vested, what we call vested correctly, or has the right name, right? It's not Jack Brown that's lending it, and it's not even Quest Trust Company lending it. It's Quest Trust Company lending it for the benefit of Jack Brown's IRA, one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is. So it's important to have all that. We check that with, with, with the lender, right? Uh, we also check to make sure that they have our address because the original note and deed of trust would have to come back to be so stored in our vault, you know, if it's coming from an IRA. It's just a little bit of thing. So we do check to make sure that it's not showing Jack's personal address. It shows Quest address. Though Jack would approve all the documents, mark them what we call read and approve at Quest. Um, but then the deed of trust, like I said, are held back with us. So key points, you cannot loan money from your IRA to, your, to yourself or any other disqualified person. I think you got that. You and the borrower uh, will set your own loan terms, not like Quest is involved with that negotiation or anyone else. I always say it's a really good idea to sit down and write it all out on a pad of paper long before you do anything else. And then especially call the attorney because when the attorney is just being paid to draft documents, they're not being paid to represent you through litigation at that point or anything like that. They're just, you know, it's just a document processing fee. So you guys have to have it worked out all those little details, like, you know, when the payments are being made, how much you're lending, if there's escrow, you know, what the escrow repair sheet looks like, you know, have all that very well organized before you go to the title company, before you go to the attorney. And that's, in my opinion, what you want to do. All right. IRAs can loan money all different types of ways. They don't have to be secured by assets of real estate. Um, uh, I've seen that other assets, mobile homes and stuff like that, whatever you want to do. There's all different types of notes that we process through our notes department. And remember, um, it's kind of switching hats now, like, how do I be a good borrower? Well, OPI, you use other people's IRAs to fund your transactions. So what I like to tell people to do, they say, well, I got my IRA and I want to use it to buy this property. No, take your IRA and loan it out and let it get something. Take your IRA and buy a rental property and let it sit in your IRA for a while. What you do to get money to buy your rental property is you go and develop relationships with people and use their retirement funds. People like myself use their retirement funds. Uh, and that works really well. You're getting interest. You're being able to buy your properties that you can't normally buy. And it funds very well. Right? Think about it, though. So many people are out there looking for private money. And if you just walked up to the average John and like, hey, man, $122,000 I can borrow from you, they're going to be like, no, man, I don't have money. But if you turn up to someone and ask them, hey, do you have you know, a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, a SEP IRA, a simple IRA, a 401k, an ESA, a health savings account, a 403b, a 457 plan, any other type of retirement plan, what do they all say? It's yes, right? It's like creating your own private bank. Imagine being able to walk up to any house out there and go, yep, I can buy that one cash and I can close quick. That's what happens when you have a cast of private investors. It's really important to understand something here. You see, there's two different skill sets that are play that sometimes don't work very well with each other. If I'm a real estate investor, finding a good deal is one skill set. You know, I'm grinding down, finding contactors, always trying to find my best price, blah, blah, blah. But finding a deal 
finding a real estate investor is different, right? You're going to build a relationship. And when they get done with loaning you this money and you pay them off and you're done with this deal, what do you want them to do? You want them to loan again and again and again, and then bring their mother's stuff and their father's and their other people in their family and bring all that to the table. So you have a big bank. You literally have your own private bank to fund your transactions, right? Um, remember, by combining those different IRAs together, like I talked about throughout, throughout this thing, allows you to have access uh, to the whole family instead of just one member or something like that. And even if you're talking to someone that's 12 years old, you know, and they have a covered L education account in the middle on it. That person's not always going to be 12 years old, and you're going to be real estate investing for many, many, many years, you know, and they're growing up and learning investing and being involved in their parents' investing. Do you see where I'm going? It's like you're planting seeds for your future uh, fundings that you have. I know a friend of mine who had borrowed over the last 11 years, I think we looked at it, it was $33 million. And I was so surprised. And he was just buying inexpensive properties, like, um, in the beginning, like 70,000, but those same things are like 140, you know, now, uh, you know, mid, mid level, three bedroom, two, two bath type of house. Uh, uh, and just did well, it was just kind of flipped, did them really quick, maybe not made a whole bunch of money on each one, but did enough of them that he did, did really well on, was a good flipper, bought some for buy and hold purposes as well, but did, did really well. And I thought, wow, man, you must have had a lot of people. He's like, no, I only, I only got seven private lenders total. Seven, that was it. And I'm like, none of them are real, like, super wealthy. I had, you know, some IRAs, but they'd lend it to me. I'd do a deal and pay them off. And then they'd have a little bit more lend, lend to me and do a deal and pay it off. And it just continued to happen that way. And, over the, and that's how it works. So my point then is it is about building a relationship, right? which is point number one from borrower's perspective. It is all about your relationship with them. Be very cautious on your first deal. Talk, take time, talk to your lender, make sure that they're comfortable with each step. Make sure they understand the foreclosure process. Make sure they know what to do if something were to happen to you. Follow up with them on each step. Tell them if you're having difficulties, like I've known lenders loan for the first time and drive out to the property and be like, they're not doing anything. It's just sitting there, right? The investor is out and his crew is working on other property. And what he's done is he's waiting for the permits. He's piled all of his stuff and he's just waiting. He's got to wait, you know, but if the lender doesn't know it and it's the very first time he's working with you, it's good to just send a little email with an update once a week, we've done this or we've done that. The communication is key to developing that relationship that will last over years and years of you guys together. Because that's basically what you're starting to do. You're developing a relationship where you're going to help each other to build wealth. All right? Talk to them about their risk top ones. Make sure that it matches what you're doing and the risk that you're putting them in. Right? Understand how desperate they are for income. Um, yeah, in other words, if they only have so much to borrow, maybe you don't want to borrow at all because you need to leave some cash for them for some emergencies or, or something like that, different things like that. Think about, about who, who you're talking about, but, but ask them what's important to them. Make sure also the process is painless, especially if you're dealing with IRAs. IRAs can be complicated. At Quest, we do all we can do to make this process easy. Remember, we have IRA specialists on staff that you could pick up the phone and call at any time with your conversation with your lender, right? These are neutral third parties. They're professionals. They're going to talk about the IRAs, and it's going to make everyone feel more comfortable. You should have that same type of relationship with a real estate attorney that will help them also make feel comfortable. I know it sounds strange. I'm going to teach them how to protect themselves against me, but in doing so, you're really developing that trust, and the trust is what you need to borrow over and over again. Remember, what we're really looking for is not just one loan. We're looking for a private bank to fund all of our transactions, and you do that by developing a uh, relationship with each lender and protect their interest at all costs. Even if you do a bad deal, 
find a way to pay your lender, find a way to do that. Uh, I had one guy years ago, he was a pretty good investor, but he had messed up a deal six ways to Sunday. I don't know how else to tell you. And he had lost a bunch on this deal. It was like 30 grand he had lost. And that was a lot. Grand back in. And I saw, and I, and he was upset. He's like, it's going to get out. I'm never going to be a borrow private money again, ever, ever. Because everyone's going to know, like it was kind of a public deal, you know, and, and it was a club and he, he was really embarrassed. And I said, well, what'd you do with your lender? He says, oh, I, I just paid him. I, it was really painful. I had to take out a, a little personal loan and pay him, you know, but I got it back. I'm, I made it back on my next deal. It's really going to kill me this year. He didn't know, but that act did get around. It did. Uh, and what was funny is that lender had went around and talked about how, what an upstanding person he was that on this bad deal, he, he paid back. And anyway, his reputation got to be so big, like everyone wanted to lend the money. You know, it was kind of funny. He, he laughed about it. It's like, I thought it was going to be the deal that uh, destroyed me. And it was the deal that really helped me because it actually showed to his integrity. That's a true story. So I thought I'd tell you. So here's a little case study for you start them up investors, right? And I love this story. It's very, very true. And I always, I always uh, laugh because I always get these people like, oh, I don't know how to be a real estate investor. I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know what to do. So this, is, this happened years ago, and I've got to watch him grow up. But a friend of mine, son, Dustin, he's, at, at the time of the story, he's only 18 years old. He's my friend because his father is a real estate investor, you know. And... Um, also, his older brothers, I, I think he had four older brothers, maybe it's three, uh, uh, old, older brothers are also real estate investors, you know, so he has some knowledge about real estate education, investing even at 18, to, to be fair, as the story goes on, right? Uh, but primarily, his income is he mows lawns. That's what he does. He mows lawns, getting ready to, ready to start college. Smart kid. He's got a scholarship, matter of fact. But primarily, he would mow lawns at his father's and brother's investment properties. You know, had, had a little trip, pickup truck, had his own little lawnmower, had his own little thing. And whenever he'd go to mow the lawns, Dustin would do one thing. He would bring a little three-by-five card, and he would write on there, I just mowed the lawn at one, two, three, four house or whatever. And I'm going to be by next Thursday to mow again. If you would like me to do mow your lawn while I'm out here, it would be inexpensive because I'm already in the area. On the flip side of his card, and it's funny that he did this because he did this without telling his dad or his brothers, right? He wrote, I would like to buy your house for cash. Kid you not. Stick them on the doors, around the houses of the house, the car mode goes off to another one. Sure enough, somebody responded to his three by five car, right? They were anxious to sell their property because they had a job in another state. They had to sell the property quickly in order to get the, the loan off their name to buy the other house that they needed in the other state that their very important job was. And he was able to ne uh, negotiate um, the, the, $62,000 for the price of this house. It's in a rural area, by the way, so that's why the pricings are a little bit low, but a uh, small town. And he estimated about $5,000 of for repairs, which, by the way, was a lot of landscaping and painting. Hint, hint. See where this story's going. All right. Uh, it, uh, and Dustin, by it going to these real estate clubs with his father at the time, had met an investor who was willing to loan him $67,000 for a three-year loan at a 10% interest rate, the $5,000 he was getting back for the repairs at the time that, that the loan closed. Why was the uh, uh, investor willing to do that? Well, he wasn't dumb. He knew that Dustin didn't have a job and Dustin was only 18 years old, right? So he, what he had told Dustin is, I will loan you the money because he liked Dustin's um, uh, you know, gumption for, for asking him for the money privately. He went up and privately spoke to several people at this investment that got him. He says, but what, I, what you'll have to do is prove to me your numbers are correct. So you have to pay for an appraisal. So Dustin did have to break out from his own pocket and pay for an appraisal at this point. But the appraisal came back on the house at $99,370. 
and the investor was willing to go on with the deal. So after paying taxes and insurance, Dustin was immediately able to rent this property and had a $212 monthly cash flow. For a kid in college, that's pretty good. Here's the next thing. Because he did a lot of the work, on course, on the repairs and stuff like that, it, the costs were only $1,200 to him. So uh, think about it just for a moment. How many houses could you buy if every time you bought a house, right, you put $3,800 in your pocket, you did it with no money down, no credit, and all you had invested was a three by five card and a pen. That's it, right? And what happens? 3,800 bucks in your pocket, $212 monthly cash flow, and he increased his net worth $32,630. And true, he never told his dad until the renter was in it because he's kind of worried that it wasn't a very good deal. And his dad was like beaming when he was all done. He's like, oh, I'm so proud. It was, it was really cute. Uh, but I, I always put it to you, like, hey, you know, if he can do it, with no credit, 18 years old, nothing else. How come you guys can't out there? True story, really happened. Uh, he ended up keeping that property. He actually still has it. When he graduated from college, he had a lot of equity in the property. It came up in value pretty good. And he kept it rented through that period of time. It's still a rental property to, to him to, to, to this day. He did, his smart kitty, he factored or kept that money um, in fact, a whole bunch of it back into repairs into the house, to tell you the truth, over a period of time. Um, but then he, when he got a real job after college, he took out a bank loan and still has this as one of his rental properties. So as he starts his new family, he's got a good auxiliary income because his uh, monthly cash flow went way up once he reduced that interest rate down to a regular bank loan. Hopefully this is helpful to you guys. This is just some of my own experiences and stuff relating to lending. I really enjoy it. Guys, if you have any questions about this stuff, the, the right thing to do is to pick up the phone and call an IRA specialist. Remember, all of our education is free at Quest. Uh, other good ways to ask quick questions is during business hours, our chat at, on our website is Man Live by IRA specialists. It's not somebody else in some other country or something like that. It's them. They're actually sitting at their desk and happy to answer your questions or make sure that you get to the right person as well. So if you guys have any questions, uh, contact us at IRA specialist at questtrust.com. Call us at 855 fun IRAs. Thanks guys. Hopefully this has been helpful. It's really been enjoyable for me. Bye now.